Okay, Maria, go ahead. Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. And welcome to what successful inclusion of non-speakers looks like, two real life examples. My name is Maria Odd, and I am the founder and co-chair of XMind's Non-Speaking Autistic Students Committee. I am also a resident of Montgomery County, Maryland, where our, the organization that's hosting us, XMind's, is based. XMind's is a nonprofit parent-run organization um, whose mission is to improve the educational experiences and outcomes of autistic students in the Montgomery County public education system. So before we begin, I'd like to cover just a few logistics. Uh, XMinds has activated closed captioning for this webinar. Also, if you are a Spanish speaker and wish to receive simultaneous interpreting of this webinar, please click on the interpretation icon on your toolbar. And if you would like to ask a question of any of our panelists, please feel free to do so at any time during this webinar by typing your question, not in the chat, but in the Q&A feature of our toolbar. Our panelists will be glad to answer uh, as many questions that they can um, squeeze in uh, toward the end of the program and we have a Q&A with the audience. Okay, so now back to the substance of our program. Besides serving as a former member of the board of XMinds, I am also the proud parent of Hannah. She is a non-speaking autistic 10-year-old girl. Personally, I would have preferred that Hannah had the opportunity to learn in an inclusive educational setting rather than have been placed in a self-contained classroom at the age of three. I would have preferred that she would have thrived in this inclusive educational classroom with a school system that would have done everything in its power to seek for her the most effective form of communication. I would have also preferred that she would have uh, received um, the presumption of competence by the school system, not through their words, but through their actions, by respecting her personal choice of effective communication. Because after all, access to communication is a fundamental human right. Instead, I found none of these things. So I took it upon myself to uh, look outside the narrative I was being provided by the school system. And very quickly, what I discovered was good news. Thoughtful, meaningful, successful inclusion of non-speakers can exist. It also already does exist. And in multiple districts throughout the country, in general education programs, in both public school districts and private schools. So I've been envisioning for quite some time um, an event like this, and I want to express my personal gratitude to X Minds for making this a reality. I am so happy uh, to be able to say that today, I introduce you to two non and or minimally speaking autistic young adults who were both fully included for part or all of their K through 12 educational experience. Mr. DJ Savarese and Ms. Lisa Valabu. Uh, both of uh, these panelists will share their lived experience being fully included in their educational experience. I also have the pleasure of introducing Mrs. Tracy Harder. Mrs. Harder was Lisa's high school English and history teacher. And she will share with us her insights into including uh, non-speakers in the general education setting uh, from an educator's perspective, which will also be extremely interesting. So, and now I would like to give our panelists an opportunity to tell us a little bit about themselves. Lisa, would you like to go first? Good evening. My name is Lisa Volato. I am 26 years old. I live in Sioux Spring, Maryland. This topic is important because inclusion played a significant role in my education 
And I hope that this talk tonight will help you explore the many possibilities that inclusion, inclusion can create. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that, Lisa. DJ, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. My name is DJ Savaris. I'm in my late 20s. I live in Iowa City, Iowa, the only UNESCO city of literature in North America. I'm sure many of you know that inclusion is why I am who I am today. And without inclusion for all, we're living in a segregated society. Who among us wants to live in that kind of world? I hope this dialogue will prompt each of us to consider why we should move beyond inclusion and into a world in which exclusion is not acceptable. That's very beautiful, DJ. Thank you. Mrs. Harder, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Tracy Harder, and I have been teaching for a little over 30 years. I, I have to say that inclusion is... Uh, not what I would consider that I did. I just take each student as they come. Over the years, uh, I have encountered many students that have different needs. And, um, you know, the, the challenge of speaking, um, our mind being able to be heard and understood is huge for everyone. And particularly um, for some students like Lisa. And so it's my joy to be here tonight and to share a little bit of my experiences um, with being an educator and uh, dealing with uh, students that challenge me to find new ways uh, to help them discover all they can be. That's wonderful, Mrs. Harder. And I love what you said about challenging you as an educator to find new ways. Um, unfortunately, sometimes the challenges is skewed, is, is skewed in the direction of the student, but I, I love to hear uh, an educator saying that, so thank you. Okay, well, I have some questions for our panelists, and I, I shall begin. Um, DJ, I'll begin with you. Can you uh, please tell the audience what you are doing now and your preferred method of communication? I identify as an artful activist, publishing writer, public scholar, teacher, and practicing optimist. I recently published a collaboration I did with artists Malcolm Corley and Jazz Groff, and fellow poets Claretta Halsey, Latif McLeod, and Joriel Watkins in a book of poetry and visual art called Studies in Brotherly Love from Prompt Press. I teach, write, and present nationally on a range of topics. Recent publications include an article in Logic magazine called Disrupting the Garden Walls on technology in speech-based societies, a co-authored piece with my dad on life writing across genres that appears in Ergol, and a scholarly chapter entitled Unearthing the Concepts that Bury Us that is forthcoming in an anthology on disability and dialogue. I teach classes on self-care and courses on poetry writing, both for alternatively communicating autistics through the Lynx Project in Chicago in global, multi-generational, inclusive courses. And as co-chair of the Alliance for Citizen-Directed Supports, I am spearheading a project entitled The Lives in Progress Collective, focused on expanding and transforming self-direction. I am also on the advisory board for Communication First. Perhaps most importantly, I am a practicing optimist who lives life as a meditation on hope. I make time every week to connect with friends I know from college and others I've met virtually since the pandemic. Finally, I prefer to communicate in written English but consider myself a multimodal. 
Thank you, DJ. And I actually read your recent publication. It was fantastic, uh, so thought provoking. I'm wondering if after this event, you might be able to send a link, if you haven't already, to that publication that maybe we could share with this audience. DJ, I'll move on to the next panel. Oh, he just sent it to us. There we go. It, it, the link to the article is in the chat, Disrupting the Garden Walls in Logic Magazine. I, I think it's a great piece of work if, if anyone is interested. Um, and Lisa, now I turn to you with the same question. Can you please tell the audience what you're doing now and your preferred method of communication? I am a full-time senior student at Washington Adventist University in Tacoma Park, Maryland, and I am graduating in May with a bachelor's degree in biology. My preferred method of communication is the letterboard. I use the letterboard to spell and communicate with the support of a communication partner. Even though I can read and speak words, they are generated primarily from impulses and compulsion. I cannot control my speech to say what I think or feel. Spelling on the letter board and sometimes on the keyboard gives me a sensory cue to slow down my thoughts, focus, and control my body to point to the correct letter. Thank you, Lisa. That's, that's so interesting, um, especially the part about not, not being able to control your speech impulses. Um, you know, that's interesting food for thought. So thank you so much for that. Um, DJ, a question for you. During pre-K through 12th grade, did you attend uh, public, or private, or parochial schools, or some combination thereof? Where did you go to school? What states or districts? I attended public school from kindergarten through 12th grade. First in Gainesville, Florida, in Alachua County at J.J. Finley Elementary, recently renamed Carol and Beatrice Parker Elementary. And then third through 12th grades in Grinnell, Iowa, in Powsheet County at Davis Elementary, Grinnell Middle School, and Grinnell Community Senior High School. I attended Oberlin College, a private, residential liberal arts college in Ohio and graduated Phi Beta Kappa in 2017 with a double major in anthropology and creative writing and concentrations in geology and somatic studies. Very impressive. Thank you, DJ. Uh, how about you, Lisa? Uh, during your pre-K through 12th grade, did you attend public, private, or parochial schools or a combination? Um, and in what state or districts? Even the, I, I moved from Brazil to California when I was five years old. I was on the special education program at Conejo Valley Unified School District in Thousand Oaks, California, for three years, the last one I was fully included with the support of an aide. After that, I attended a Christian private school in Newberry Park, California, Corneo Adventist Elementary School from second grade until eighth grade. For high school, I attend Newberry Park Adventist Academy, a private Christian school in Newberry Park, California. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Lisa. Uh, and Lisa, another question for you. At what point in your, and I think you alluded to this in your, in your last answer, but at what point in your K through 12 education were you meaningfully included um, in the general edu education uh, classroom? And was there a time when you were not included? Even though I was fully included with the support of an aide since second grade, I could only participate in the same curriculum as my peers, 
during my sophomore year of high school because I started using the letter board to communicate. My education became meaningful because it changed my path from a certificate of completion to a high school diploma. And yes, there were several times that I felt not included because inclusion is constantly evolving. I am learning to navigate in a world not designed for autism, and the world is learning how to create changes to support me. Well, that's fascinating. So in other words, when you were, were finally able to find uh, your most effective form of communication, that's when you truly began to feel at least meaningfully included. Um, so, you know, that's, that's uh, a very important point. Thank you. Uh, Tracy, a question for you, Mrs. Harder. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> I can't, with teachers, I have to go by. <laughs> <laughs> You're not this is harder. <laughs> uh, what was your role in ensuring that Lisa was fully included? You know, I have to be honest with you. Um, when I was told that Lisa was going to come to my classroom, uh, I, I really had no idea how to include her. Um, because I had no understanding of what she had done in the past, skill level, whatever. I was just told that um, she would be on a certificate of completion to do as much as she could. Uh, that is a challenge for me uh, because I didn't know what she needed. And so I just threw stuff out there uh, to see what she could do. And throughout the year, I, I learned so much uh, from Lisa. And I think that the things that I carry the most with me from that first year, uh, she was part of the seating chart. She didn't sit off to the side um, by herself. She did have um, somebody sitting with her. Um, she, um, I just, she had all the books we had. She had all the things that we were doing in class. Um, I didn't set anything separate um, when we did vocabulary um, quizzes or whatever. She had the same thing everybody else had. We worked on what can she do? What does she need help with? But I'll be honest, there was a very brilliant girl sitting quietly in my class. And I came to appreciate how much was going on inside her head, but that she struggled to share with me. And uh, it's, it's been a great pleasure to me to learn more about what it means to not be able to get that information out. I have a daughter who has sensory processing disorder and she, um, she looks at um, the world in a little different way and it's about processing information back out. So I, I've had experience with that, but my joy, my joy was finding out that Lisa could write beautifully. We did Thanksgiving journals and she wrote beautifully, beautifully about um, her world, what she loved, what she was thankful for. It was very, very inspiring to me. Beautiful. And, um, you know, I, I really love your point about it's, it's not about what's, what's going in. It's about what's not coming out because there's so much in there. And you know, sometimes I get concerned that not everyone understands that. Mm -hmm. um, they confuse in, in a temporary inability to, to give output uh, with the inability to receive the information. And they're two very different yeah. things. So- Yes, it's very true. And I, um, you know, the times to me, the, the bravery for Lisa to stand up and speak when it's so difficult, um, she would present in class, sometimes with her iPad, but sometimes on her own. And I, to me, the the challenge for her was so far greater than what what I even knew 
um, until later when I did more reading. So I, 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 I have to say, you know, kudos to Lisa. Um, it's, it's an amazing challenge and um, I think only brilliant minds can deal with it. Thank you very much, Mrs. Harder. Um, DJ, uh, at what time, uh, at what point in your education did you feel you were meaningfully included uh, in the general education classroom? And was there a time when, when you felt you were not included? I was meaningfully included from kindergarten through college graduation. Wow, that's fantastic. <laughs> that's very good news. Um, so I guess that goes to say there was never a time where you did not feel meaningfully included and that's very optimistic information. Um, so thank you for that. Um, Lisa, the next question I have is for you. Uh, what did inclusion look like for you? What supports did you receive throughout the day? And which of those supports were the most effective for you? I had two different experiences with inclusion with and without a meaningful way to communicate. First inclusion meant that I could go to the same school as my sisters with the support of a team of professionals, including a speech pathologist, occupational therapist, psychologist, and a full-time aide. The team created strategies to help me achieve my goals, including helping my body cope with all the sensory challenges related to a classroom. I had a sensory diet and would take several breaks during the day. I had the opportunity to learn these skills alongside my peers, which helped me feel more confident about myself. At the same time, my peers were learning about me, and together we created a partnership of support and growth. Later on, when I learned to spell on a letter board, I could participate in a more meaningful way in the classroom and interact more with my peers. The most effective support I received was having a communication partner to help me communicate on the letter board. Thank you. Yes, having a communication partner uh, uh, to to support you when you're working on the letter board and using the letter board to communicate. I, I hear that from so many. That is such a key form of support. So thank you for sharing that, Lisa. Um, what about you, DJ? Uh, what did inclusion look like for you? Uh, what supports did you receive throughout the day and which of them were, did you find to be the most effective? I was like everyone else. I never felt like I was any different. I used my own languages, sign language, photos, icons, and AAC, but the other kids used them alongside me. If I had to say what was the most effective, I'd say having other kids who were doing just what I was doing and not feeling like we weren't allowed to best ourselves and learn. I maybe never have understood why anyone said I was included because I was never a special kid in any way. I loved anyone I met at school because they knew I was smart. I know what I should say. I should say that having sensory motor breaks and visual supports, a support assistant and extended time on tests helped, but none of that would have mattered if I hadn't had my friends beside me showing me what life was all about. Oh, absolutely. Um, is that, it's that need that we all have for human connection and that support that that gives us, um, the empowerment that that gives us, that's so important. Um, and you know that right there is such a strong argument for inclusion um, you know rather than just focusing on merely the supports that are needed but also having those supports in an environment of inclusion uh, genuine inclusion so you have that kind of social support i think that's wonderful thank you so much dj um lisa did you receive um any sort of 
well-intentioned but ultimately misguided supports that were either meaningless or even potentially obstacles to your ability to communicate effectively or integrate with the rest of the class? Yes, I did receive well-intentioned support that did not help me. Nothing is more painful than being tortured by repetition about skills you already know. It is essential to learn from past mistakes and keep moving forward. The biggest challenge is that no one specific program can address all students. Each of us needs a path that meets our unique needs. It is okay to make mistakes along the way, but always move forward in a new direction, trying new options to create new possibilities. That's so interesting. Thank you, Lisa. Yes, um, unfortunately, it's it's all too common that um, um, students in self-contained classrooms or in particular non or minimally speaking students receive um, below age grade instruction repetition over and over again, um, you know, till they graduate from or till they receive their certificates. Um, and, uh, you know, this goes again to the point that we made earlier, which is um, the, the, the information's going in. That's, that's not the issue. It's, it's getting the information that's in there out. So, uh, you know, thank you very much for that. Um, DJ, what about you? Did you have any of these uh, forms of sort of well-intentioned but misguided supports that ultimately were obstacles or, or problematic in some way? I think I was as managed as anyone could be in middle school and high school. It allowed me to get a lot done while I was at school, which was good, but it meant I didn't have a lot of good friends like I did in college, where I had lots more time outside of class around my friends. I'm not saying I didn't have friends in middle school and high school. I had friends and my two closest friends were Erica and Emily, but I think I was less free to just be with my friends in 5th through 12th grade. In kindergarten through 2nd grade, I had a lot of close friends. We used to have skate parties and trampoline parties and gymnastics parties and swim, skate, and jump on our trampolines a lot. I'm still in touch with some of them. I saw a lot more of my friends early on, but I saw less of them in high school when I started having study hall one-on-one. -on -one. Very interesting. Thank you very much, DJ. Um, Mrs. Harder, I actually have a, a question for you. Um, sure. Did, um, in your role of, of you know, including uh, Lisa or potentially other uh, non-speakers into your classroom, did you encounter obstacles? Uh, and if so, how did you overcome them? Um, you know, the obstacles that I, I encountered were more about um, my lack of knowledge of a clear path of here's what you could do. The other, I think the biggest obstacle that I really um, struggled with was helping the rest of our staff um, understand that um, there was so much more going on in Lisa and there were so many more emotions from what, what was physically there. Um, her family was marvelous support and they were, you know, they were always including her and doing things with her. But I think, you know, in our mindset, sometimes when we don't know what to do, we err on the side of minimal rather than the most. And once I realized that there was so much Lisa could do, uh, that was an, a way that I opened up. I think um, I was thinking about our history classes, Lisa. And um, I remember one time um, on that particular day, um, 
Lisa and her um, assistant would, went into my back office so that they could, she could do the test and using her, her um, you know, to be able to spell out her answers. And I had let the students have what we call five mad minutes with their book. And I told um, Lisa's assistant, she can have five minutes with her book. And Lisa was like, nope, it's cheating. I don't need that. And that's when I really truly realized that there was, there was so much more that I would never personally see, but that, that she would be able to go so far with it. And that's when I was like, turn her loose, let her go, let her, let her go as far as she can. And um, she was able to, to really, she did more in one year, one and a half years than I've ever seen any student do. Speaking oh, or not. Yeah. yeah. And that sounds to me, Mrs. Harder, like what happened there was you started to presume competence. Yes. Well, not just that, but to recognize that all I had to do was step back and let her go and yeah. she would be able to do whatever she needed to. I needed to get out of the way. Right, right. And I would argue that that's presuming competence. You, 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 you understood that Lisa can really do this. Yes, she um, had a fantastic team. And I think that is key. And yeah. the, the communication between the school and that team is huge. Okay. So perhaps uh, the, the, the way you overcame those obstacles was presuming competence and uh, more communication, ensuring a streamlined mm -hmm. communication between school and, and home. Okay, very yes. good, thank you. Um, and uh, also uh, for you, Mrs. Harder, how were you able to convince doubters um, or purse holders, if you will, that this program um, inclusion, not sure if it was an official program, but inclusion itself uh, was worth trying in the absence of a lot of hard data. One of the advantages of teaching in a private school is the option for us to be able to uh, have students that may not learn in exactly the same way, like Lisa um, mentioned earlier, that having the ability to be able to adjust and grow as she needed to, um, as, a, as a teacher in, in that school kind of school, it was, it was not as difficult as it might've been in a school where they had very defined, um, competencies at this point. If you didn't make that point, then you can't go to this point. Um, for us, it was a, a continuum that allowed her to grow as fast as she needed. And by her junior and senior year, um, she was far exceeding uh, what many other students were doing. And that's, like I say, an advantage that a private school has that may be not um, available in a school mm -hmm. district. Interesting. And, you know, I think of it, uh, I guess the question that comes to my mind is in the, the public schools are, the, the, the students are supposed to be protected from exactly that rigidity in the public school through um, uh, the idea laws and uh, IEPs, individualized education pro educational programs. So that's, kind of, that's a very interesting and kind of loaded observation that I could probably well, spend six hours talking. I, I, I love it though. I just, that, that's yes, what dawned on I me. Have yeah. A, yeah, I have a daughter who teaches third grade in, in public school and she is so defined. Um, you know, she said, I want to reach down and help these kids that are coming in, you know, because of COVID, they're not learning the same way. And she's so frustrated. She said, I'm stuck with my third grade and I know I need to do other things, but that's for a specialist, I have to. And that, I think that's one of the things that I think any student who struggles with, whether it's sensory processing, wherever you are on that spectrum, um, from dyslexia to uh, non-speaking to even non interaction autism. Um, 
to be able to have the freedom to um, not define, you can only go here because these people are the only people who can help you. And then these other teachers, they'll help you with this. And these other teachers, rather than having it be a community um, that works for the betterment of the, of the student. So interesting. Thank you so much for that insight, Mrs. Harder. Uh, DJ, for you, could you briefly describe uh, the Im impact inclusion had on your life, your academic life, your social life, and your general outlook and day-to-day -day life, for example? I needed to be fully included for my own well-being. I like my life a lot, and I don't think I would have it if I hadn't been included all my life. I love my academic life. I was able to get into a golden college and thrive there academically, studying a lot of different subjects and not having to mainly commit to studying one thing. I think I was well prepared academically for college, better than most kids, and that allowed me to enjoy myself a lot more. I love my life. I have many long-time friendships with friends from school, teachers, and professors. I love my day. I might miss being in person with people during the pandemic, but I connect and collaborate with friends and colleagues every day online. I think that is my hope, to always feel a part of something bigger than myself. I feel like I can make a difference now without exhausting myself. Without being included, I wouldn't know what living is all about. Wow, without being included, I wouldn't know what living is all about. My goodness, what a, what a <laughs> poetry. Thank you. Thank you, DJ. And um, I love the repetition of, I like my life a lot. I love my life. I love my day. Um, that's beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, Lisa, same question for you. Could you describe the impact inclusion has had on your life? Inclusion played a crucial role in helping me access my education and increase my self-esteem. Attending the same program as my peers opened many opportunities for interactions outside the school. It also helped me be less anxious about going to new places and meeting new people. Inclusion also enabled me to learn tools to better self-regulate my body. Today, I enjoy traveling eating out, going to movies, hanging out with friends, and I believe that inclusion was the foundation for me to develop many social skills. Yeah, definitely the part about um, increasing self-esteem really, really speaks to me. I, I, I can see, I can see where that's a, that's a game changer. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Lisa. Um, DJ, are there specific pragmatic factors you identify as critical in your receiving an educational experience in which you could thrive? Again, I think no one ever asked these questions. I felt just like everyone else. What mattered was that I felt like an integral part of the community, there to learn and there to lead. I hear what you're saying. You're very, this was a very matter of fact experience for you, it seems, as opposed to you know, rigid and contrived and specific programs in place. Um, that's so wonderful and so exemplary. Um, how about you, Lisa? Um, are there specific pragmatic factors you identify as critical in your receiving an educational experience in which you could thrive? Access to my means of communication is the breaking point for success or defeat. Presuming competence is the least assumption one can make of any student. The combination of these two factors led to where I am today. By presuming competence, you're opening a door for me to enter. 
and by using my letter board, I can demonstrate that I am ready and capable. Yes, the, uh, I, there was a, a paper written about that uh, probably about 40 years now about um, presuming competence is the least dangerous assumption. Um, very, very um, um, important piece of, of, of literature. And I, I might actually, um, at the end of this program, send a link to it um, so that we can forward it on to our audience as well. It's a very good piece on presuming competence. And I like that marriage of having, um, you know, the presumption of competence combined with effective form of communication. Those, those two married together really were, um, you know, what, what made this effective on a very pragmatic level. So that's um, very insightful. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, Mrs. Harder, are there yes. any uh, pragmatic um, sort of pieces of advice uh, that uh, you found, or not necessarily pieces of advice, but that were critical uh, in providing uh, an inclusive environment for Lisa? As a teacher, you know, we're put into a, a place where, you know, we have students that have needs and they're different. Every, you know, I've had kids who couldn't come in and sit in a chair in the afternoon class because they were just tired of sitting in that chair. And so they sat on the floor. Um, I've had uh, so many different aspects. But one of the things that I do want to comment on um, her letter board, Lisa's letter board, uh, was a new thing for me. I did not, um, I, I did not have any knowledge of its use or the program or anything. And once I learned uh, the value of it and how important it was for Lisa, she was a whip on that thing. She could just letter, 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 letter. She was so fast. And when I realized that this was allowing her to, to express what I would not have known any other way. It's so significant for educators and, and for parents to realize that, you know, we worry about, do they really know it? Did a teacher, you know, or the advocate or whatever, um, you know, help them along? And I learned very quickly, Lisa, did not need help from anybody and that she was able to do uh, far beyond um, my personal expectations because I didn't know, I hadn't had her in elementary. So, you know, I really didn't know what she could do. Um, but I think sometimes the fear of unknown, like how did they get that answer? Did they have help? Did they, you know, that was not the case with Lisa because Lisa was very Lisa. And when she did it, you know, she did it and she knew it. And uh, so I learned a lot as an educator from her and watching her as she learned and very shortly knew that I just needed to teach and she would be there. Thank you, Mrs. Harder. Uh, another question for you, Mrs. Harder. Um, what advice might you have for school administrators um, to ensure that non or minimally speaking students receive an inclusive education? Again, being in private school, it's a little easier. Um, mostly for administrators, it's um, for them to be um, shown the abilities to be able to see the programs, to understand what the different, um, for example, the letter board, what it would do for, for a student to be able to use it. You know, the understanding of that is probably the first step. But then the second step is to recognize it as it's going along for the teacher to inform the administrator and then for parents to have those conversations. Um, Lisa mentioned her team and the team to communicate, not just with the teachers, but administrator and to have the parents a part of that. And then one of the things that I admired was the education that was given to everybody around that you don't have to stop and baby Lisa, 
You don't have to stop and, oh, she can't understand. She was just included as part of the whole and encouraged to be a part of the conversation and encouraged to be a part of the group rather than, you know, oh, we're going to do this special for this one student. And that's probably the best advice any administrator can have. You know, don't limit the interaction, don't limit and allow students to learn. Learning is huge for um, speaking <laughs> students and for, you know, the average classroom uh, to learn that inclusion isn't about accommodating always. It's just be a part of us. Beautiful. Thank you, Mrs. Harder. Um, Lisa, for you, once once you were in, you know, quote unquote, the right setting for you, uh, what did you find were your biggest challenges, if any? The correct setting for me was participating in the neurotypical classroom with my communication partner's support. The biggest challenge was teaching everyone to speak directly to me instead of my communication partner. Using my communication partner's support as a bridge and not as the main highway. It is important to ask me and wait for my response because you need to walk on my path to know me. That's uh, so interesting. And I like that analogy to the bridge versus the main highway. And just on a personal note, that's uh, you know something I try to teach people all the time with my own daughter is, you know, they'll ask me the question and I'll remind them, you know, ask Hannah. Um, and it's a learning process. Uh, and I think eventually people get it. But yes, I, I see that as a challenge uh, as well. And I'm sure Hannah does as well. So thank you for that interesting piece. Um, what about you, DJ? It, it sounds like it was always a right setting for you, which is wonderful news. But if there was one setting that was better than the other, what did what did you find? You know, once you got there, what the biggest challenge was, if any? I loved school and rarely felt challenged by anything except maybe the sad, sad stories we sometimes read in English and history and the cafeteria felt too loud and I felt left out without a way to communicate during lunch. That's interesting. So some of these sort of sensory processing um, issues were, were the biggest challenge. That's, that's very uh, good to know. Thank you, DJ. Um, Mrs. Harder, we talked about administrators, but what advice do you have also for educators? Um, to ensure inclusion of non or minimally speaking autistics? You know, I had very little, um, growing up, I had an, a cousin uh, who had cerebral palsy and he was a math physics kind of person at, in the UC system. And he taught, he had a language assistant and he would write out his lectures and um, his assistant would do a lot of interaction. That was long before computers. Um, I also spent two summers with a girl who had um, cerebral palsy and her speech was very limited and she'd get very frustrated. Um, so I had had experience with, you know, with people who struggled to speak, but it was never about their brain. And so I think my expectation was not the same as other people. But one of the things that I have done um, partially um, because of my experience with um, Lisa as well as other students, I went to find um, resources. And I discovered that people have been studying this for such a long time. And I was such a latecomer and so I went back to the beginning and I started with a book called The Out of Sync Child oh. um, by Carol Kranowitz, Great right? Mm -hmm. And then I went to The Sensory Sensitive Child um, by Karen Smith. And then, you know, I went on to Raising a Sensory Smart Child and looking at the optimistic side of, of working with um, any person 
on that. And I had a friend, she goes, oh my gosh, that's me. And she was probably 50 years old. And she said, I thought I was the only person in the world. <laughs> and so I began to realize that for educators and for parents, you know, go find some books, find, you know, like this webinar, find, find information because the more information you have, the, the more comfortable you are with whatever the need is. And that's huge, huge to educate yourself. And I, I have done many, how shall I say, and my daughter also has done many presentations for teachers. Um, Alyssa, I thought I'm gonna empower her at a young age. And but by the time she was seven or eight, she knew about sensory processing. She knew about what sensory diet would set her off. She knew, you know, there were so many things that I could teach her. So she felt like she had control, but it's, it's the knowledge of what you need to find and what you need to know that is so huge in advocating and, and just, you know, loving um, all these people with all their differences. Love it. And uh, love how you refer to that literature as the op optimist or optimism side or optimistic side, um, you know, literature that actually, you know, is helpful in, in moving this forward um, and, and giving meaningful support uh, to, to, to anyone who needs it. Uh, so that's, that's wonderful. Thank you. That's, uh, that's great. Um, so uh, DJ, what advice do you have for educators to ensure non or minimally speaking students receive an inclusive education? It looks like uh, DJ has placed his response in the chat. So I will read it out loud. That's an indicator that his device is malfunctioning. So I will read this out loud. Um, DJ states, I think uh, what teachers need to realize is we can encourage all kids by being there. I think I could thank anyone. It would, if I could thank anyone, it would be my teachers and support assistants who never thought my presence in their classroom was a burden. I never felt like anyone was wondering if I should be there. I never felt self-doubt. I think they realized that without me there, the classroom wouldn't have been such an anxiety-free environment. And teachers need to believe in their students. That's what made me feel a necessary part of every environment I was in. That's beautiful, DJ, thank you. I really like this statement. I think they realized that without me there, the classroom wouldn't have been such an anxiety-free environment. What a statement. <laughs> That's great. Um, Lisa, and what advice would you have, Lisa, uh, for educators to ensure inclusion of non or minimally speaking students? I was blessed by having high school teachers and staff willing to embark with me on a new path. Because of their support and open-minded attitude, I graduated with my class and got my high school diploma. So, my advice is don't be afraid of trying something new. Learning and teaching can be a beautiful quilt where teachers and students bring their unique patches and can create together a world that is more inclusive. We are all different, but we all want to be seen and to belong. Yes, we are all different, but we all want to be seen and we all want to belong. That is uh, so true. And I, I actually hear that um, in, my, in my work as an advocate for non and minimal speakers, I, I hear almost that exact same statement over and over again. Um, so, so thank you for sharing that, Lisa. Um, DJ, what advice do you have for school administrators to ensure that non or minimally speaking students receive an inclusive education? 
Maybe I think they're not as important as they may think. Get out of the way. Day to day matters. Let us grow at the here we go. I think we have uh, we have the the full answer here in the chat, which I will read. Uh, maybe I think they're not as important as important as they may think. Get out of the way. It's in the day to day matters that we come to feel essential. Let us grow at the individual level. Don't place us somewhere as if we don't matter, as if we never hoped for a life worth living. Um, I have one word response to that. Bravo. <laughs> That's a, a very uh, meaningful and, and loaded response. And I think it's wonderful. Thank you, DJ. Um, Lisa, what advice do you have for school administrators? The doors that are open for inclusion and support in the lower grades will determine what opportunities will be available later for higher education. The choices you are making today about creating a space for new possibilities will change the path for many of your students. Therefore, my advice is simple. Believe in the human potential to overcome adversity, to be creative, and finding different solutions for a challenge. Take a stand to support and include diversity in your school. I don't need to be like you to be valued and to have the same opportunities. That's amazing. I don't need to be like you. Um you know, to receive these same opportunities. Uh, that's, that's a beautiful statement. And I think that's um, something that is so basic and yet somehow eludes many. So thank you for that statement, Lisa. Um, DJ, what advice do you have uh, for parents um, to ensure that their non-speaking children are receiving an inclusive education. Uh, and we have um, DJ's response in the chat, which I will read. I love my parents. I'd answer, read my dad's book, Reasonable People, and do what they did, and let us be. Don't best us with your own intentions and find ways to let us build relationships in our lives for ourselves, always. Beautiful, thank you for that, DJ. Um, Lisa, what advice do you have for parents? Look for a school environment that celebrates diversity and try to form a partnership of support, respect, and accountability. Inclusion is more than a physical space, but a way of thinking that transcend walls. Parents need to be actively involved in their kids' education and modeling advocacy skills, so as they grow older, they know how to advocate for themselves. I like that. Um, parents need to be modeling advocacy skills. That is... Um... Fantastic advice. Thank you, Lisa. That's really great. And I'm going to keep that in mind um, as a parent. Uh, what advice would you have, Mrs. Harder, for parents? Um, I stand in awe of parents. You know, being a parent of a, a daughter with sensory processing, um, she's graduating, she's in graduate school, second quarter just finished. And, you know, every day is a challenge for every parent, but it's a greater challenge for my child. And I think recognizing that as a parent, that to separate, you know, as parents, we, we hold it close and we want it to own it and to allow the child to own it, but to advocate 
for whatever they feel they need is so huge. And I have had to learn that, you know, as a parent to allow my daughter to learn to advocate for herself, to learn how her brain likes to advocate for herself and not have it be mine. Um, being able to separate that, that's huge. But, you know, I'm also, my daughter's, you know, 25, so it's a little different um, than somebody who has a young child. But overall, I think for parents, consider your child that they're, they can do anything and don't, don't limit, well, there's, there's too many sensory things come in, so we will never do that again. Don't stop living life. Find ways to make life available. And whether that's in education, whether that's in recreational things, whether that's in friendships, um, recognizing there are ways, different ways. And it's just about finding the one that works for your family, for your child in an environment that allows them to have the greatest opportunities. I I have to say that, you know, that was one of the things that I admired about, about Lisa's family is that it was about helping her have the most opportunities. And it was a learning thing for me to be able to see that, wow, you know, get rid of my presupposed ideas and, you know, just allow her to thrive because thriving is allowing opportunity to be individual and not what I think it should be. Oh, that's great. Thank you. So we're coming to, to a conclusion uh, of this portion of the event. I just have a final question um, for all of our panelists. Is there anything else you would like to share with our audience tonight before we move on to the question and answer session? I'll begin with Lisa. I am actively involved in advocating higher education for women with disabilities and individuals with autism. According to the UNESCO data, women with disabilities are often less likely to reap the benefits of a formal education than disabled men, marginalized not only by their disability, but also by their gender. So thank you for the opportunity to share my story tonight. Thank you, Mrs. Harder, for joining us tonight. Thank you, Lisa. Um, Mrs. Harder, is there anything you would like to share? Uh, well, one of the things that I really appreciate about being a part of this, I, I'm very honored because you know, I, I have no training in special education. I have no, you know, no more knowledge than is available to anyone else. Um, it really is about a willingness uh, to open. Oh. For everyone, whether it's dealing with autism or somewhere else on the spectrum, recognizing that it's gonna take work, it's going to take time, but every bit of that is about growing as a, as a part of humanity. And we all are part of humanity. We sometimes want to go away from what we don't know, but what we don't know is just a door to open to find more and new worlds. And I, Mrs. Harder, I think we're losing you. I just sent her a message while we wait for Mrs. Harder to come back. Um, DJ, is there anything you would like to add? Yeah. Yes, I do. For one thing, as early as third grade, everybody moved from class to class with different teachers. 
I love this because I could stay in my body if I needed to move. A common myth is that we need familiarity and sameness, but if you use a visual schedule with class icons and teachers' photos, it's fun and easy to move from classroom to classroom and teacher to teacher. For another thing, eight of the 20 kids in my kindergarten class stayed with me through first and second grade. Instead of requesting a particular teacher, their parents requested that their son or daughter stay in whatever class I was in. And, finally, I'll leave you with this question. Do you know anyone who has ever excelled in segregated, special education classes? No. Then there is no rationale for putting them there. What a great point. Thank you, DJ. Mrs. Harder, we lost you there for a couple of minutes. Would you, <laughs> did you want to, to add a few more sentences now that we've got you back? Oh, you're, you're muted, Mrs. Harder. There we go. Okay. Um, I, I guess what I want to say is to allow the greatest opportunities, you know, socially, academically, um, spiritually, all of the different components that make our lives valuable, I don't think any child, no matter what, should be excluded from that. And I think these two beautiful young people are truly the, um, the product of not um, putting boundaries on who they are or what they are. Wonderful, thank you very much. Okay, so I think um, we now will turn to the Q&A with the audience and uh, XMIND's president, Jean uh, Weingartner, will be moderating that, this portion of the event. Hello, everybody. Hi, Lisa, DJ, and Tracy. I'm really honored to be here to be able to moderate this uh, last Q&A session. Um, just a note to our audience, um, I will there may be a pause between reading the questions and getting the answers as we give Lisa and DJ time to type their answers. And either I will be reading their answers or uh, DJ will be using his device. Uh, so the first question we got is uh, someone who says, I am a minimal speaker who types. What can I do to help reshape people's pervasive misconceptions about us? DJ, go ahead. Be out in the world as much as you can and engage with as many people as possible. I love that. <laughs> Thank you. And Lisa says, focus on the people who care about you. No one has the power to set your limit. Excellent, thank you. Um, Can I make one more suggestion? Yeah, absolutely. Well, ever since I've had Lisa and um, our school has gone to all iPads, you know, the kids text each other all the time, but uh, we have had um, two different autistic students um, you know, um, and one of the things that we discovered was we could all type 
and then let it talk for us. And we took conversations that way. Um, and it was fun because you're in class and if everybody talked, it would be just chaos, but they could carry the conversation on in a, in a, a you know, either in a Google uh, meet or in some other way on the same document and they could chat out of way. Um, and it was a great way to include um, other students that, you know, for whatever reason, I'm too shy, um, you know, our autistic student as well as, as our ones who talk way too much. It kind of limited some of what they can do too. That's fantastic, thank you. Um, our next question is, uh, my son Truman is at the start Of his, uh, so is Truman is at the start of his inclusion journey. Trumi's a non-speaking autistic kindergartner this year. From your perspectives, what should we be prioritizing now? What questions should we be asking that we probably haven't thought to ask yet? And Tracy, if you have anything to say while Lisa and DJ are writing, you're welcome to. Well, I don't do elementary, but my husband and daughter both do. And in my experience, um, helping them with different programs outside of the classroom, one of the biggest questions I think you can ask every teacher is, um, do you feel that my child is going to take up more time? because that's honestly probably one of the first things many teachers think. And to, to help them understand that the more that they allow the child to be a part of the class, the less burden it is, but they don't think that way. And understanding that, you know, part of learning is learning about the student and not the limitations, but the maximum that they can go. I'm always for, go for it, go for it, go beyond. Um, and that that's something to learn about your teacher um, and then to encourage them, you know, don't limit my child, just let them go. If we need to do extra stuff, we'll do extra stuff along the way, but let my child go. Excellent. Yeah, advocating for your child is always such an important thing and teaching them to advocate for themselves, mm -hmm. as Lisa mentioned earlier. DJ, go ahead. I'd say focus on teaching reading and writing in school and at home. I think it's so important to meaningfully engage with the regular curriculum. Check out how I did that at listen to microsecond.net. Thank you. I'm going to put the listen to us.net in the chat again for you all. And Lisa responds, make sure that the kids in the classroom has an opportunity to ask questions and learn about your child. It is so easy for kids to accept other kids when the adults don't get involved. True. I love that. <laughs> the kids are the future. <laughs> um, we have a uh, um, sort of logistical question for um, DJ. Uh, I may have missed this, but does DJ also use a letter board like Lisa does? What is your uh, main method of communication, DJ? Uh, 
Uh, DJ says, in answer to the person above, check out my webinar on creating hope. Um, and that is a webinar on, I believe, the listen to us.net page. So the webinar, uh, creating hope in 2020. Okay, so um, the next question we have is about another young child. My son is five and is currently learning to use touch chat to communicate his wants and needs. He also has challenges with impulsivity, eloping, and hyperactivity that currently make it difficult for him to be present in a classroom setting. As a parent, I would love to hear more about how to best help and advocate for him, i.e. the sensory diet you mentioned, Lisa. If you have any comments. Oh, DJ is ready. I use everything I can. I handwrite, I type, I sign, I speak. Mrs. Harder, do you have any comments? Uh, the books that I, I talked about, The Out of Sync Child, um, you know, what spoke to me as I started reading that is, you know, there was a family counselor who was talking about, you know, I, I visited my son's classroom at Christmas and all the children are listening to a story, Christmas story, and my child's under the tree eating up uh, an ornament, one of the little, you know, ones that are made out of... Um, flower and she said I thought oh dear where am I where have I gone wrong and I think as as we look at sensory diet you know there's so much input and we never know you know what's going in because we can't always um, judge out and so for my daughter it's been you know sometimes we limit the noise sometimes you use ear, ear you know plugs or 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 now she has um, ear headphones, but um, also physical activity um, is huge. Um, swinging to calm, all those things that you had on grandma's front porch to make it the end of the day okay. You know, we don't, we don't do them anymore because we think, oh, that takes time. Um, so those kinds of things, proprioceptive activities, it takes a lot of energy can help that too push the laundry basket full, um, you know, go outside and push, you know, the wagon that's full of heavy stuff. Those kinds of things can really help. Excellent, thank you. Um, I apologize, I skipped a question. I asked two questions and answered in the wrong order. Um, I wasn't processing it correctly. Is that Maria, what you were? No, actually, Jean, I, I, if it's all right, I wanted huh? to offer some thoughts on this question as well. Uh, the, so um, I actually, a similar, at a totally different uh, panel that I, uh, event that I was just an audience member of, someone asked a similar question um, to uh, a non-speaking panelist. And what he explained, which I thought was very interesting, was um, communication methods or devices that, um, that allowed him to communicate just his wants and needs were though helpful, better than nothing, um, did not come close to what he really needed to express himself. And uh, I think his exact words were, you know, wants and needs help, but the 26 letters lead to infinity. So he encouraged parents and educators to teach uh, or to help uh, non-minimal speakers uh, spell. Uh, and he went on to explain that so many of his, um, so much of his emotional and sensory dysregulation just as a result of being able to get out his thoughts through, um, you know, spelling words um, just decreased tremendously. So if that's any help, that was something that really influenced me as a parent and I just wanted to uh, pay it forward. Excellent, thank you. Um, and that sort of 
puts those two questions that I mashed together in a good answer. Um, the original question, which was, does DJ use a letter board? He responded, I use everything I can. I handwrite, I type, I sign, I speak. I even letter board with some people. So that answers the first question. And then the second question about the sensory uh, needs, which Tracy answered and Maria helped answer. Um, Lisa responded with physical activities and a special diet really helped me with sensory overload and to have better control of my body. And it, look, it looks like DJ has something else to say. I agree. It's not easy to know explicitly what will be useful to him, but it's about sensory. It's not personal. Check out Jordan Zimmerman's short film. Also, the sound of a mechanized voice irritated me until I was in the second grade. I think that's fascinating. Um, you have to find the right voice, I guess, to <laughs> for you. <laughs> um, and uh, Jordan Zimmerman, we had um, her a couple of webinars ago. Her short film is called, yes, this is not about me. Thank you, Tana, who put this in the, um, I'm going to put this in the, um, a link to this film in the chat. Um, and you can also look in XMind's past webinars for an interview with um, Jordan, who is fantastic as well. Okay, so our next question is, what was most helpful in finding the right method of communication as you were growing up? Lisa responds, finding the right method of communication was like opening a prison door. That's amazing. I'm glad you found it, Lisa. Go ahead, DJ. I think choosing a lot of different ones, photos, signs, AAC, typing on a labeler that allowed me to touch the words and letting me choose which ones worked best in which situations and learning something new, not just asking me to become a speaking person. Excellent. Thank you for that because the uh, goal is communication, not necessarily speech. All right, so our next question is for Lisa and Tracy. Were there any challenges using the letter board and communication partner interpreting during instruction? Do you have any tips for school teams? And if DJ has anything to say about this, you are welcome to chime in as well. Hmm. Well, I'm going to say that I had I had no question that what I got from Lisa was like a door opening for her. So I had no doubt about it. 
um, I never thought that her, um, her partner was going to do anything but what Lisa said, because Lisa was very, mm, how do I say this, um, firm in what she knew and firm in, in what was okay. And so for me, I knew that Lisa would tell on them if they were doing anything that she didn't tell them what to do. So I had no trouble with that. I, I guess I can understand from a teacher's perspective, um, how do you know? But my, I always err on the side of, well, let's see how far it goes. And when you, when you open that door and you see how far, the student can go, there's no doubt. I mean, just look at what she's able to do now. And the fact that she's finishing college for heaven's sakes, you know, um, that's, you know, it's, there's no doubt to me, but I think that teachers, you know, to be able to learn about it, that's really important education. So if you have a child who uses a letter board, um, Definitely talk to the teachers about how it works, what it looks like for your child, because how Lisa uses it won't be the same as DJ, won't be the same as any other child, um, because they each have their own way. It's it's the same device, but it's like saying everybody uses the iPad the same way. Mm, no. Awesome, thank you. And Lisa says, what has always helped me is to have time to respond, not to be rushed. Okay. DJ, did you have an answer for this or should we move on? DJ doesn't have an answer. So we will next move on um, to, the question, uh, my son is 14 years old, and we recently, about a year ago, discovered his pretty profound intellect via rapid prompting method, RPM. He hadn't really meaningfully communicated prior to that in more than 10 years. While this has been fantastic, it has also ratcheted up his own self-awareness about his many behavioral challenges. He feels unable to control his own body and can be both destructive and self-injurious too, and that has made him pretty severely depressed. Have either of you experienced deep depression like this? And was there anything that you did or any activity you participated in that helped? And also note you are welcome to talk about or not talk about your own personal experience in depression if you'd like, or you can generalize. And if you have comments, Mrs. Harder, you can also. My only experience with this was a, a young boy that my daughter did play therapy with. Um, the family had gone through, um, uh, it was vaccinations. He went from speaking at 18 months to nothing at, at two. And my daughter did play therapy with him and um, played alongside him and was there one of the first days he said, mama, again. And it was very exciting but he could be really destructive. And um, they had a special room for him with special things where she could go with him and be with him. And the self-destruction would not be impactful, I guess is the best way I can say. And so I think surrounding any child with a safe zone is huge um, for that. But not stopping the intellect just because there are other issues. Those, you know, they may go and they may come, um, but the intellect is always there and should be encouraged always. Thank you. DJ? I think I answered. Watch my Creating Hope webinar. I think it's on my Listen to My Girl Second website. Thank you, DJ. So again, that was the um, link in the listen to us.net. Uh, Lisa also said, COVID has been hard and I feel blue sometimes. Listening to music, doing yoga helps me. So maybe finding just the right thing that can help and finding the right mental health you know, care is also very important. 
Uh, it is 8.30. We have one last question, which um, is sort of more of a wish than a question. Um, the person says also would love to have a list of supports available to a family like ours, i.e. parent support groups or training resources for him to integrate successfully into community events, etc. beyond just the therapeutic recreation offered by Montgomery County. So I don't, you know, expect you guys, DJ and Lisa and Tracy to have like a list of supports available to families in Montgomery County, but do you have any um support or type of support that was really helpful to you as you grew up and into yourselves probably the closest support that i can think of as a family is to is to offer opportunities to do things together. Um, sometimes when it's difficult, we pull away because we're uncomfortable. When someone's depressed, we step away because we can't do anything and we feel helpless. Um, when in fact, just being there, um, you know, like Piglet and Pooh, um, it's nice to be together and to be able to support each other. Finding those things, um, my daughter, we bought a swing um, and um, we would swing with her. And, you know, yeah, I had a thousand other things to do besides grading papers and all the things I needed to do as a mom. Um, but we, we found opportunities to enjoy music together. She loved to dance. Um, she loved movement, um, but especially um, that. And swimming, by the way, in the summer. You know, in California, it's lovely here. Um, you may be cold, but we're having a very lovely, you know, 80 degree day. Um, but it's swimming is off, awesome for that bilateral to help calm the mind, to help do. And um, if you can get out into a, a place where you can swim with your family, it's huge. It's really huge. And she loved that and still is a water baby. Excellent. So find what someone loves and <laughs> go with that. Uh, Lisa says, I'm not familiar with Montgomery County. Growing up, I loved doing gymnastics, going to the beach and riding my bike. And we also at X Minds have a uh, non a page about supporting your um, non-speaking autistic student. And I know that um, we plan to offer some more things there soon. Um, Maria has plans, but um, <laughs> we, uh, I've just put it in the chat so you guys can check out some of those resources. And DJ uh, has an answer as well. I don't have an answer for that. The Iowa City Autism Community Parent Group has good ideas. Maybe join it and see if any ideas translate into your county. That's fantastic. You don't have to, you know, stick local. Like, <laughs> we live in this global community now. Find what you can. Uh, so I, as it is past our time, I'm going to pass it over, back over to Maria. Um, thank you, DJ and Lisa and Tracy. This was amazing. Great, thank you, Jean. Um, so it looks like we are out of time. Uh, I'd like to take a moment to thank X Minds for hosting this event, as well as to thank our audience uh, for joining us this evening and your excellent uh, questions. Um, of course, my heartfelt thanks to our panelists, Lisa Valado, DJ Savarese, and Mrs. Tracy Harder. Your insights, determination and thinking outside the box has been eye-opening, thought-provoking and encouraging. Thank you all so much. Before we leave tonight, X Minds would like to ask everyone to please fill out an evaluation form, which you can access through the QR code on the slide 
or by clicking on the link in the chat. Please also consider donating to X Minds by clicking on the donation link in the chat. Thanks again, everyone, and good night.